Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth, where we may not have all the answers, but we're going to ask a heck of a lot of questions. You can also visit thebitterpill.info. The website now is up, and you can become a spoonful of sugar or a uh, the bitter pill or the medicine going down uh, by visiting the patreon.com uh, forward slash bitter truth link there. You can also listen to the shows there, and I'm going to start doing some blogs there as far as essays and things like that go, like I was writing for Texas Free Press back in the day, which wasn't too long ago. So there's that. Um, today, excited, uh, guest uh, of the show uh, today is uh, former Libertarian chairman from 1985-1987. He currently serves on the Altamont Springs City Commission. He's also serving that position as a Libertarian. Um, now, also, he's the Florida campaign chair for the George Jorgensen Spike Cohen campaign. Mr. Jim Turney, how are you, man? Doing great. How are you, Abe? I'm good, man. I'm good. So uh, you guys have been running and gunning, and uh, you know, you guys uh, have Jim and uh, you have Joe and uh, Spike coming into town uh, next week, right? I do. I've got them both on different days. Uh, they're not going to be here together, but they're going to be uh, one day after the other. And um, of course, um, I've just got my mail ballot in the mail this weekend. So that means everybody around here in Florida and probably many other states are starting to vote. So this is crunch time for both the presidential campaign as well as local campaign. As you pointed out, I am a, uh, a local elected official here in my city in Florida, but and I'm not up for re-election this year. I got re-elected last year, mm -hmm. and uh, but there's plenty of friends who are running, and so um, uh, there's a lot going on around here right now. It's this crunch time in the election cycle with uh, people actually starting to vote over the next few weeks, and um, all the hard work we've been doing for months is starting to come to fruition. Nice. For the good or bad. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to end eventually. We just don't know how. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, uh, and real quick, I know we're going to talk about, you know, uh, Joe and the campaign and everything, but, but real quick, um, just you personally, uh, serving as a libertarian in a, uh, the, Altamont City, uh, the Altamont Springs City Commission, uh, and the reason I ask is because Texas, um, where I live, you know, and some other states, have been notoriously hostile toward independence and uh, alternative parties. So like, how, how has that been going for you out there um, as, as a libertarian member of, uh, of the city commission? It's going great. It is worth noting that uh, the city commission uh, seat is uh, nonpartisan, but uh, everybody knows I'm a libertarian pretty much. Um, it's not hidden at all. And yeah, everybody knows who every, everybody who's elected is usually affiliated with some party or another, of course, even if they're serving nonpartisan. But uh, we're doing pretty good here. We have a county commissioner, for example, in my county, which is Seminole County. Um, his name is Andre Class, and he is running. That is a partisan race. And he is, uh, we're expecting today, I wish I could say I'd already heard the news, but uh, we're expecting to hear that the Orlando Sentinel, the newspaper here is uh, for the Orlando region is going to endorse him but he is doing extremely well uh, he's the talk of the county and in a very positive way so there's not been a big um, uh, fear of libertarians around here it seems uh, at least we haven't seen the talk of it and sure. the reaction that way I'm sure there's a lot of doubt harbored by many people, uh, many voters, and of course, other elected officials about just what to expect because they haven't seen too many libertarians elected. Right. And we have, of course, had a few notable, uh, let's say, bad apples uh, in the libertarian party in this <clears throat> area, which are gone, thank goodness, now. But uh, they were around for a while some years ago that um, got bad press. But I, I don't even hear about that, um, but Good. but I know it's there, and I'm sure, sure. other people are aware of it. But um, but you know we're still a young party, uh, even though I'm uh, going to be 70 years old soon, and I have voted Libertarian my entire life since I was eligible to vote back in those days. You had to be 21, and so uh, we're not that young, but we're still by the standards of the Republicans and Democrats, we're still a young party, especially in the context, as I said, of uh, having elected people. So most uh, most voters are just don't know exactly what to expect when there's a libertarian. And uh, so we still have a lot of work to do, obviously, to um, 
really make people comfortable, which I guess is your question. How comfortable are people with me as a libertarian in office? I've gotten no negative reaction or feedback on that. Uh, some positive. Um, usually it's, uh, it's, you know, so what kind of, you yeah, know, yeah, a yeah, libertarian, yeah. great, uh, yeah. do your job and that's it. There's no, uh, you know, questioning about the party affiliation. Well, I mean, because last year uh, we had a, <clears throat> an issue and uh, it was actually a libertarian who brought it to court against the state of Texas. And it wasn't just for the libertarians. It was after going after every party. It was going after the greens and everybody. And uh, a guy named Neil Dykeman actually sued the state successfully, got an injunction on this really draconian law that basically had everybody paying three to five thousand dollars to run for office in the state of Texas. And that was hostile. And then this year, the Greens tried to, you know, the, or the Democrats tried to sue the Green Party out of being on the ballot. They lost here, but they won in some other states. And so it's just not between the Republicans and the Democrats. It just, just doesn't seem like we're running a very Democratic or Republican system. Um, that was no, the, the, my uh, point to candidates is, and to the public as well, is that the Libertarian Party has a message. And that message is that Libertarian Party candidates are not treated fairly in the election process. And you just put your finger on an example. Uh, the biggest harm that's done to the Libertarian Party is when governmental processes, such as ballot access or these kind of uh, other criteria to get on the ballot when they are different for the Libertarian Party than they are for the other parties. Mm -hmm. And that's often the case. Fortunately, not here so much in Florida, but in many states. The, Of course, the other area where we have, uh, let's say, unfair treatment is by the news media. And um, we but, you know, even there, we're making some breakthroughs. Um, right now, I'm waiting on news that the Orlando Sentinel, which is the local uh, paper of record, mm -hmm. is going to endorse the Libertarian Party candidate for county commission here in my county. In my nice. county. Nice. Um, the, um, if, if it, they don't do it, it's because the, uh, they broke a tie that they had, I'm told, on the editorial board uh, where, right. um, you know, they had a tie over who they were going to endorse. And I think they've supposedly going to break that today and and write an endorsement we don't know what the the tiebreaker was but uh hopefully i'll know later today or tomorrow but the uh, other thing is um that where we're not treated fairly is in the debates especially presidential debates mm -hmm. uh, as i said i've voted libertarian my entire life now and uh and most americans have seen over pretty much their entire life they've seen a libertarian party candidate on the ballot for president so they're used to seeing that. Even if they don't hear much about the libertarians, otherwise they get to the poll and they look at their ballot and they go, well, there's what's this a libertarian candidate for president here? And they see that cycle after cycle. But what they also notice is the high profile presidential debates come and go decade after decade. And there's not ever a libertarian there. So there is uh, some degree of awareness that we need to raise about the uh, libertarian parties, uh, the treatment that we get. And uh, as long as they're fair, uh, we don't have a complaint. We don't require equal treatment because we're not equal to the Republicans and Democrats, but we do expect to be treated fairly. So that's an issue that I think we need to continue messaging. Real quick, because I do want to move on to the Jorgensen campaign, but when you say you're not uh, equal to the Republicans and Democrats, you mean in size, right? Because, I mean, every every yeah. every party should have a voice in this system. I mean, you, the Greens, uh, Gloria LaRiva, whoever, uh, it shouldn't matter what size, you know, you occupy. I mean, when you say you're not equal, what do you, what do you well, mean? Yeah, I, when I say treated fairly, I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, th that's not the same as equal. We don't, we don't really, for example, in the media, we don't deserve equal time to the Republicans and Democrats. We deserve to be mentioned. We deserve, especially when it's relevant, uh, when they're just making a comment in general about a campaign uh, or an election cycle. But we don't have the number of people elected that the Republicans and Democrats do. We don't have the number of people registered to vote with uh, affiliated with us. Uh, we don't have uh, in most metrics, we are not as large and as influential. So I don't think that it's fair for us to ask for equal treatment to the Republicans and Democrats. I do think we should be treated fairly, meaning uh, whenever there is a rule made about, okay, we're going to have presidential debates, 
who is going to be allowed to be in those debates? If they just said, anybody who wants to run for president, please raise your hand. You can be in the debates. There'd be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people sure. uh, raising their hand. So they do need some sort of criteria, but it needs to be a reasonable and fair criteria. And the way they do it right now is, I think, pretty obviously unfair right, to right. anything because, I mean, they're, they're making, not only are they making a very, very high threshold of an average of 15% in the national polls. Which is an arbitrary, the, which, is, which is an arbitrary number set by exactly. a, a committee. But even though you can always kind of argue that it's an arbitrary number, but what really makes it unfair is that the polls that they use, most of them at least, don't even include the Libertarian Party candidate in the poll. You can't right. poll fifteen percent when you're not in the poll. I mean, See, but, and, to, and to your point, I think, and this is you know, to your point a second ago. I think you were being, I think you were being too kind when you said that uh, you know we, we don't do this, and you know the Democrats and Republicans do this, and we don't do this. Well, you don't do that, and neither do the Greens because they don't treat you fairly to do that. If more exactly. people, if more people knew who you were, you wouldn't be having these challenges. If you know the, the Commission on Presidential Debates, which is an, uh, a private nonprofit run by ex-Dems, ex-Republicans, and a bunch of corporate spooks. Yeah. They're, 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 they're deciding who's going to debate. That's not at all – not, I mean, it's not, a, it's, not an elected, it's not an elected body. It's not appointed by the president. It's, not, it's nothing. It's just a bunch right. of spooks. And, then, and, and so you guys not you know, getting some of the coverage, it's not so much because you, I don't, because you don't deserve it or you haven't measured up. It's because they won't even give you the exposure to let people make an informed decision. Right. If the media doesn't give us a reasonable amount of coverage, the fact that we're on the ballot and that we've been on the ballot for so many years uh, in almost every state, and right. many times on the ballot in all 50 states, of course, uh, then they are – we think they're not doing their job of treating us fairly. But we, of course, believe they have a right to be wrong and misrepresent even – who they are and how fair they are. But uh, if they're doing their job fairly, uh, treating us fairly, then we would be uh, better known. But also if there wasn't the, uh, like you pointed out, those laws in Texas that create a barrier to entry to the ballot and many other ballot access laws that treat us differently and make it difficult. Well, we spend a lot of our money that could have been spent on campaigning and getting our message out, getting our name recognition up. We spend it instead on getting on the ballot. Uh, and like that example you just mentioned a few minutes ago. So that's another example where it hurts us. And then, of course, if the pollsters don't include the candidates which are on the ballot, it, especially in all 50 states, if they don't even include us in the polls, then obviously that creates a situation where we cannot ever meet the criteria, even if it's a fair criteria in terms of the percentage number or whatever. So there's just so many ways in which um, there are obstacles that are unfair. So I, I want to stick with that word unfair, um, you know, because I think that it is a matter of fairness and that is a subjective thing, I'll admit. But it, we are so far from being treated fairly that at this point, I don't think any reasonable subjective evaluation would say, yeah, the Libertarian Party is treated fairly in the election process. But you could argue, of course, where is that point where, OK, you're now being treated fairly? But we're we're far from that point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and so jumping jumping into the Jurgensen campaign here. Um, you know, let, let's talk about some of the things I'm sure we agree on, um, you know, and, and let the let the things we don't agree on kind of fall where they may. But, you know, what I love about uh, you guys and, 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 the, and the Greens specifically is your, your, your take on foreign policy. You know, neither neither one of y'all and including the Socialist Party are, are for these foreign wars and these and these misadventures overseas. I mean, we're we, five coup attempts now in Venezuela, you know, and, and, and just to steal resources. I mean, w w at what point does this does the American people understand that we're not we're not fighting for our freedom? Well, you know, there's we do too many wars without declaring a war. Uh, so I believe that the vote in a representative democracy, something as profound as war needs to be dealt with by our elected representatives to approve it before we send soldiers abroad. Obviously, right. if we're attacked out of the blue by somebody, the president should, as commander in chief, should react immediately right. uh, to defend the country. I'm not arguing that. You, know, you shan't, can't fire a bullet without, you know, a 
congressional mandate, but um, but it needs to be certainly when we start talking about war and get it to that level, then we need to have congressional declaration and approval of the war in a formal declaration of war, not these funky, uh, you know, uh, police actions. Uh, yeah, police actions that are approved by resolutions like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution or something. Right, you know? right. Uh, so, you know, like make it a declaration of war. Come on. Uh, it's very clear in the Constitution. This is not something that should be ambiguous. However, we do have a situation in some other countries uh, where uh, there's a lot of Americans who would voluntarily uh, act to help out people who are suffering in other countries in various ways, not just because of natural disasters, but that's a good example too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, not just because of humanitarian disasters, but that's an example too, mm -hmm. but also because of oppressive regimes like in Venezuela. But whether the U.S. government should get involved in that is another story. We okay, but, do back, have but, see, but back, but back up a, a second. But, but back up a second. That's a CIA talking point right there. To call Venezuela, and it, I'm sorry, it's an, it, it, to call it, it a, an oppressive regime. They got they, they elected the guy, whether or not I like him. I don't care if I'm having him over for Chinese dinner. It doesn't matter. It's like what, what business is it of mine? And by the way, right next door, Colombia. That's not an oppressive regime, but they say they're capitalist, right? So they so they can they can they can kill journalists and they can and they can have a forty percent uh, poverty rate and they can murder campesinos by the thousands. But it's okay because yeah. they're capitalists, so we like them. What's, what's the difference? If we want to call one guy an oppressive regime, it's not, it's not probable to call the, without calling the other guy an oppressive regime. Well, I think as individuals, we can use those words based on our personal evaluation or organizations, private organizations of individuals. But I think you're absolutely right. When it comes to the government, this is not the government's job. It's to defend and protect America and not to be the world policeman. So the government shouldn't be in the business of trying to decide that uh, there's a country over there somewhere that is not a threat to the U.S. in terms of a military threat, at least. And they are, um, you know, what, whatever their, uh, whatever else you say about them, they're not a military threat. So the right. U.S. government doesn't have a reason to try to evaluate uh, whether they should be attacked, for example. Right. <laughs> that, that's not a question, in my opinion, and the libertarians' uh, non-interventionist foreign policy is, I think, fairly clear about that. But like any other policy, there definitely could be some gray areas. Sure, so sure. We well, like you, said earlier, if if somebody, like you said earlier, somebody fires on us, you know, we got to do something. And I, I get that. I'm not, I'm not 12. But we're, we're in 149 countries right now. I mean, how, how many more, play, how, you know, China has two bases outside of China. We got 100, we, 49, with 1,200 bases, you know, and, and that doesn't even count all the covert stuff. So, like, why are we insistent on this model that just does not, it's not a strategic model? Well, so far, and, and I'm not in favor of it, um, but uh, the reasoning is basically that uh, we're the world's policemen, to put it into a word. And right. a lot of Americans do support that because they believe that America needs to be strong. There's a lot of conversation about how um, that if we are not going to be overwhelmingly strong militarily as well as economically, then countries like China are going to fill that vacuum by bringing in their military and those people would argue that the only reason that there are not a lot more Chinese bases is because there are all of those U.S. bases. There might be some truth to some of that, but that is not something that um, – it's something, I guess, the way I look at it, we, we pretty much created that kind of a world. Not entirely. The world already had a lot of people who were willing uh, – leaders sure. of the world sure. who wanted to be – uh, aggressive, adversarially aggressive to their neighbors long before there was the United States. That's not something new. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do uh, do um, make it actually easier for uh, countries to have a dictatorship that's aggressive. And uh, that 
for example, when the U.S. supports somebody and we call them like the guy, you use your example in Colombia. So let's, and this hasn't happened yet in Colombia, but it happened in El Salvador, for sure. example, in That's Nicaragua. Right. We say, oh, the guy there is, you know, he's one of us. He's friendly to us. So we're going to help him out. We'll, uh, you know, we'll provide helicopters and tanks and uniforms for the soldiers. And then the poor people under that dictator, they see all these American clothed and armed soldiers that the dictator has. And so that makes it real easy for the adversaries of the United States and for freedom to come in and say, look, that, look whose side the bad guy who's ruining your life. Look whose side he's on. Sure. So those are the bad guys. We're the good guys. We'll come in and help you. Please help us overthrow your, your government. And so that's how we end up with Maduro's in Venezuela and, uh, you know, all the other people in that region who've been but see, we never, but we never, but we, but we never, as a culture, ask the question: How did this happen? When Chavez got elected in 1999, 2000, Venezuela yeah. had a 50 percent poverty rate. Man, people, I had an uncle who lived there till he died. He left the Middle East when he was like 17 with my dad, and he lived in Venezuela. Had a couple of shops, and he's a businessman. Yeah. Lived there and till he died. Mm. And he would tell us how I mean, he did okay, so he wasn't starving. But 50 percent of the country was starving to death, and we didn't care when they were quote capitalists, which was translation for give us your oil for nothing. And have your people work for nothing and they get nothing. And we'll give the, the, the dictator guy, you know, who we call Presidente, we give him a half a million bucks a year and a couple of Cadillacs. And he's cool. If we rape his entire country, he doesn't care. So, what, and, you know, that, that's kind of my point is we never ask how that happened. Cuba, you know, every time I talk to a Cuban national who's all pissed off at cash, I'm like, why don't you get pissed off at us? Because after the Spanish-American War, we screwed you guys for 60 years and then we installed a guy. Right. Bautista was no saint and he was not elected. He was installed by us. How do you get a Castro? You, how do you get a Castro? You got a Bautista. And nobody asks that question. Well, I think um, some of us do. Libertarians do. But I agree as a society, we're not coming to grips with this. However, the one of the areas that gets a lot of traction with our left leaning educational and media and entertainment worlds is the theory that the alternative to uh, a free market system or a capitalist system is uh, is is some kind of socialism where the government runs the economy so therefore supposedly these kind of bad guys can't prevail but they blame uh, the this uh, business-oriented model uh, on free market and capitalism, which is wrong. What it is, is big government. So you have a situation where there's a lot of power in Washington. They can throw their weight around in many ways internationally. <clears throat> and what they, those, that means there's tremendous value there for certain businesses and political interests to collude and direct that activity so that that becomes the rape of those countries like you just described. Sure, sure. With, and this is, I mean, Cuba kind of famously was, you know, that was a lot of organized crime down there. Mm -hmm. And organized crime had tremendous influence in the U.S. government at the time. In fact, sure there's did. a great movie that came out a, a year ago right now that's very much about that, even though it's purported to be about the life of a union leader and and how he ended up dying, namely Jimmy Hoffa. And uh, The Irishman is the name of the movie, by the way. And I would invite anyone listening here to you really should take another look at that movie if you've already seen it. I have. Yes. If you haven't seen it, then still, when you look at it or when you take your second look, stop thinking about the surface story about right. Jimmy Hoffa and start looking at the movie as an explanation for things like Cuba, mm -hmm. why Kennedy was assassinated. That's the real story in that movie. And it has a lot to do with the organized crime uh, influence in government. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that includes uh, particularly at that time, uh, organized crimes, heavy influence in the Cuban government. And so, Organized crime is a uh, was maybe not so much anymore a big issue, but uh, we still have uh, loads of problems in our society with uh, and with with a combination of big business and big government. Um, that is any of these big institutional things when they start colluding, and you have a lot of power vested in government. Um, it leads to bad ends 
It, mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. it allows, it makes a real significant reward for the people who are bad players to work hard to get the levers of power, whether behind the scenes or even sometimes out in the open. Right. So that's, it's typical of any issue that comes up with me for the end result to be the bottom lines of the story is, or should I say the bitter truth is, <laughs> yeah, well, is we need less government. We right. need less government. Well, That's less government or less, let, see, but hang on, but, but less government or less business. Cause what we live is, we live in an inverted totalitarianism as Sheldon Woolen says, we don't have a dictator. We don't have Stalin, right? We don't, we don't have Pol Pot, right? We got, we got, we got, Amazon. We got IBM. These guys own the government. But by default, they own the government and they get their way. They, they, and, and, and Raytheon gets the glorified welfare. We keep buying stuff from them that we don't need to, to bomb stuff that, that we don't need to bomb. It's not a strategically smart model. What, what, is a, what does a Jorgensen White House look like on foreign policy? Like, what are some of the first things she wants to do in her first hundred days? I think and she's re- going to bring and, and, the troops some. And, and, and I, all those bases that you were talking about, she's yeah. going to start a a uh, strategic withdrawal. Uh, she's going to have the generals in the Oval Office saying, okay, how do we do this strategically so that we don't end up causing a lot of death and destruction to people who've been our supporters right. around those bases? Right. You can't just bring them all home on the first day like some people say. That doesn't work. Um, and uh, so you have to try to unravel this uh, thing. And one of the things would be this military industrial complex you just alluded to, to use Eisenhower's label for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it needs to be unraveled. And because you get these, uh, 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 many of these big businesses, some of the ones you named are in effect created by the big power of government and in the way it spends money and um, the fact that it is just spending so much money in some areas that frankly, uh, at least in my view are not needed. Mm -hmm. So you, so it's a chicken and egg sort of a thing, but I think if you start decreasing the size and influence of government in many spheres of life, stop that intervening both in foreign and domestic policies, I think you'll find that uh, there will still be some big businesses, but they'll be, let's say, naturally grown big business, and they'll be very vulnerable to competition. So you look back, you don't have to look back very far into, let's say, the Internet history. That was a relatively unregulated sphere. Right. Well, some of the companies that were really big in the 90s basically don't exist right now, or right. they are a, a fraction of their previous self. And that is because the competition was wide open. There was no governmental regulatory system that tended to protect the incumbent company that had already established itself. And so that's where that's where we have to be careful. So when if you don't have the government picking winners and creating losers as often they do unintentionally, I'm not saying that's what they're trying to do, but that's the effect of what they're doing. Then what happens is um, you, you still can get dominant players, Mm -hmm. but they have to keep up their quality and they have to keep up down their prices to keep from being overtaken by a competitor because it's wide open for there to be competition. Well, but that's no but, regulatory protection. There. Right. But that's, but that's the point of competition, isn't it? I mean, these, yeah. these so, the so-called capitalists in this country says he wants competition. He doesn't, he wants, he wants a, a monopoly, you know? Oh, they, oh they, yeah. The they're the guys, they're the guys who pay the Congress to come up with a, a million rules. So it becomes prohibitive Absolutely. for the little guy to get in and, and actually have a shot at creating a business. Now, you know why we need libertarians in office because we are guided by principle and we're not going to be, and we should be thrown out if we don't say, Hey, let's put the, uh, this business, uh, protection away. We don't, we should not be making regulations which have the primary effect of uh, protecting an incumbent business, somebody Mm -hmm. already in the business. But as most most regulations have that effect, no matter what their intention is, that is their primary effect rather than, for example, consumer protection, which is Mm -hmm. usually the given reason for the regulation. So if, you know, of course, businesses are going to hate that. I used to, when I was, oftentimes I, uh, I speak to business groups and 
I you often ask them, how many people in this room think there's too much government regulation at, let's say, the Chamber of Commerce sure, or the Better sure. Business Bureau meeting? Right. And guess what? Almost every hand goes up. Right. How, then I say, okay, how many people think there's that too much regulation applies to your business in your industry? Almost no hands go up. In other words, they, in general, they like the concept of minimal regulation. But when it comes to their industry, they, oh no, our industry needs to be regulated. Our, well, because, that's, because that's otherwise, right. because otherwise you don't need cops or soldiers or doctors or comedians. I mean, this, this, yeah. this, this is the thing that drives me crazy when we talk about, if you call them protections, people like them. When you call them regulations, nobody likes them, right? I don't like speeding tickets, right. right? I get pissy with speeding tickets, but when I know they're trying to protect me, so I don't drive like an asshole going 90 miles an hour, then I'm like, okay, they're trying to protect me. Okay. Then I accept it. This, and some of them are draconian ridiculous rules that obviously were put in because someone was paid to put in. I mean, it's no big secret that Mitch McCornhole and, and Nancy Pelosi aren't using each other as, as hand warmers. I mean, she just approved Trump's military budget for $132 billion for the next 10 years on top of any congressional increases. And, wow. and, and, and then the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of humankind this last spring with the CARES Act, McConnell basically gave her the paper and she said, okie dokie, and a couple of little negotiations, and then everybody voted for it because they were all paid to do so. And so when, when, so without any protections whatsoever, this is just all unencumbered. So I agree with you on a lot of what you're saying. I just think we can, we kind of go the other way too much when we say we don't want to have any regulations because you got to have something. Oh, no, I, I'm not it for no regulation. Well, first of all, let me point out something that's very uncomfortable to libertarians. Uh, and I've been saying this for a long time, so I've had had fun with this uh, point for for a few decades now. Uh, <laughs> libertarian, I I'm telling I I point out that in a free market economy, there would be more regulation than we have now. It's in other words, we are fortunate that we don't get all the government we pay for. As bad as regulation is, and as helpful to the incumbent businesses, the you know to stay in business even when they're producing lower quality or higher prices, it would. Those things are still minimal in terms of protection regulations that we would have in a libertarian society. So th that sounds controversial and at first counterintuitive. But the reason for it is because humans are by nature risk averse. So what happens is people would start making all sorts of privately created rules that would not mean that the price could be in artificially held up as these government regulations do, or that the quality could be decreased because there's nobody who's going to be able to come in inexpensively and make a better quality product even for the same price or, the high, or a higher price. But what regulations would exist would still be, for example, they would stop you from driving like a maniac that you just described. Because right. the people who owned the private roads and the insurance they would just simply say, you know, it's too risky to have you out here on the road if you don't have insurance. So you've got to prove you've got insurance. If you don't, I mean, if you lost it 10 minutes ago, you're off the road today, right now. It right. Just, your insurance just terminated. You're not no longer on the road. They would, they would use technology to make sure that you were insured. And guess what the insurance companies are going to say? If you're going to drive a sloppy car that's not well-maintained, or you're going to drive like a maniac, uh, then you're risky. We don't, we're going to either A, charge you a lot more money, or B, we're not going to insure you. Right. So the, there, you know, we could go on about this for a long time, but I think it's fairly obvious that there would be very strictly enforced regulation in a free market economy but it would be regulation that's sensible because it would be brought about by the companies and the people mostly by the people but right now we don't have we don't have a free market economy right now right we are now far from it we because right now you got it. alec writing legislation you got big pharma able yep. to dictate their prices for as long as they want as long as yep. the patent lasts, I mean, you got you got them charging, you know, eight, nine hundred bucks a month for something they sell for ten dollars in Australia because Australia regulates their ass. You can't sell that pill for seven hundred bucks. It's fifteen or twenty. Yep. Make your profit, make your profit, be, but don't gouge people. Here we don't have that. You know, the, the big the great God business is not a free market economy in this country. Totally agree. I I I definitely kick back whenever uh, in disagreement. Whenever um, I hear people 
uh, describe our economy as a free market economy. We're, we're, it's far from it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a heavily regulated economy, but not in the natural, let's say, organic regulatory scheme that you would have in a true free market economy or something mm -hmm. close to it. I mean, sure. you know, free market economy is sort of like a utopia in a way. You'll never 100% get there. It'll always be something that's imperfectly about the freedom of the market. But, um, but, a cent but in terms of government intervention and regulation, uh, we really need it to be minimal so that the kind of regulation we get which there will be plenty of, and there will be people with skin in the game who have good reason to enforce it. Unlike the regulators we have now, they don't need, they don't really enforce a lot of the regulations because right. it's, it's a revolving door. They're going to get a, their job. They're going to get a, they keep their job first. And then they get a nice seven figure gig when they get out of the regulatory, which is, which exactly. is phenomenal for the last 30 years. I mean, you, you leave, you leave the EPA and you go work for Exxon for a million bucks a year. It's ridiculous. Well, hey Jim, listen. Um, you know, I know you got I know you got an agenda today and a big week coming up in the next last few minutes here. What uh, what do you want to leave the listeners with? I'm going to put the information to the Jorgensen campaign in the link of, or the body of the show. But um, you know, we and we kind of covered a whole lot of uh, area today. So, but and I appreciate you, you know, just kind of going with it. But like, so what what are, what are, what are some of the last things uh, you want to talk about the campaign? Like um, in, in closing. Well, we are the if this airs. Uh, somewhere before, let's say, in the middle of October, uh, we're in our final push to uh, to get uh, the money to make a uh, big dent in the end because we've had a lot, a big boom in the interest in the Joe Jorgensen campaign over the last uh, week since the debate, the first debate, presidential debate, that turned into <laughs> a ridiculous uh, show. And believe me, it blew up our website. The, our website, everybody I'll wanted bet. to suddenly find out about Joe Jorgensen. So <laughs> we, uh, we, we are trying to leverage that oh, tremendous boost in energy and attention uh, that we got uh, to make a um, a last minute push. So we we hope that uh, people who like the campaign and her, even if you think you need to vote for the lesser of two evils, yes. hey, you can still throw us a bone and help us out, and that help push America a little bit more in the libertarian direction by donating to the Joe Jorgensen campaign, so that we can leverage this big uh, interest that that's popped up here since the first presidential debate uh, into uh, some more votes uh, to putting the name in front of voters who haven't yet heard about the option of Joe Jorgensen. And the other thing we're going to do is, um, which there'll be more news on it maybe by the time this airs, is um, an, a fourth presidential debate. Now, of course, the second one is in question right now because of the COVID diagnosis of Trump. Right. However, uh, before that happened, we started a uh, effort to get a fourth presidential debate organized that would, of course, have uh, Joe Jorgensen participating and uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And it would be in Chicago on the 24th of October. Okay. So you're going to start hearing about that in the next uh, day or two. And that uh, will, like I say, might be after this broadcast goes out. So maybe you'll already know more about it. It may not happen, of course. There's all sorts of reasons why it won't. Sure. But we are pushing for it, and it will not be organized by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Right. So it's um, we we don't know if it'll happen, but so far it's there's a lot of positive uh, things. Uh, about it and so but that's a lengthy separate conversation and, uh, well, well yeah. you're, you'll, you'll 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 be back on i got a feeling you'll be back on i had i had a great time man i, I pre and i appreciate your uh, candor and just being open um folks uh, my uh, my guest has been jim turney uh he is the florida chair for the uh, libertarian campaign of joe jorgensen and uh spike cohen uh you can also um you know visit the information that i'm gonna have in the body of the show Again, thebittertruth.info. You can support the show there. You can listen on Podcast Addict, Spotify, everywhere you listen to podcasts for absolutely free. And uh, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to. Sleep tight. <laughs>